about the beef cattle market outlook. And so we'll cover, cover a few different things today. Uh, we're going to talk about the outlook for beef prices and cattle prices here as we move into 2022, sorry, no, 2023 and 2024. We'll talk about some aspects of rebuilding the herd as we move out of the drought or at least into more normal weather conditions. And then finally, we're going to just have a very short stint, two or three slides on, on some potential new growth in the beef processing industry here in the High Plains and what that could mean or some thought processes there on, on um, uh, water demands here on the Texas High Plains. So we'll go ahead and dive in. Uh, again, as I said, we're going to start with beef cattle market outlook. I think economists in general, we sometimes have a tend to overcomplicate uh, the outlook for different commodities. The, the reality is it all boils down to supply and demand. Um, if supply goes up and demand stays flat, prices are going to go down, right? And the flip side is true of that as well. Uh, so it very fundamentally boils down to those two things and how quickly they are moving away from each other. Um, we're going to talk then again about restocking the herd, when, how, what is the profitable way to go about that activity, and then again, finally, some influences on growing live cattle demand in West Texas here in the Texas High Plains. Um, and then I guess hopefully we'll get done in time for a few questions at the end. So starting here with the beef cattle market outlook, I will say I've enjoyed talking about the beef market outlook here recently a lot more than the crop market outlook and more than I liked talking about the beef outlook uh, for the last four years of my career because things are looking very positive in terms of uh, live cattle price, cow-calf level returns, and beef demand. So what we start with again is the demand side of the equation. Uh, is demand strong? Is it good? What does the picture look like and what does it look like going forward? So what we have behind me here is the all fresh retail beef price index, or sorry, beef demand index. What this does is it takes uh, production um, and, and uses that. We divide um, total production by the number of people in the United States to get demand. So uh, we have uh, total consumption per capita. We multiply that by average retail prices and that gives us a sense of what the demand picture looks like. And as you can see from the chart behind me, going back to 2000 and looking out to 2021 and, and into 2022 even, um, beef demand is very strong, right? And we had some unusual market influences in the beef sector. Obviously, for the last two years, we think about COVID shutdowns of packing plants and some backing up of cattle in the feedlots. Even ignoring these two unusual years, beef demand was relatively strong as we were in the last part of the 2010s. So 109, when we look back and we compare that to a 100 base value, it rose partly because of some, some increases in production, certainly, but also because uh, the price strength and the quantity demand from consumers for beef has really grown. We look back to the beef quality audit that began there in the mid-2000s and their, their demand. Am I squeaking out there? Sorry about that. Um, the demand increase we've seen from the mid-2000s as the amount of choice in the pipeline has gone up as a percentage of all sales. Consumers have an easier time accessing a high quality product and having a more uh, uh, price accessible, high quality uh, center of the plate offering from the beef industry. And so we'll see that even when people switch out of our high value cuts and into some uh, uh, lower value cuts off of a beef carcass, they're making that switch as opposed to switching out of beef altogether and moving into poultry. So there's really a lot of positive strength here on the demand side of the beef uh, value equation. Thinking about where that all boils down to, there's a lot of things that, that go into the total value of a beef carcass. One of the things we like to focus on, particularly for the cull cow market, is the wholesale uh, uh, boneless beef prices. So this is fresh, 90% lean, and we get most of our lean here. When it's 90%, that's going to be very indicative of the cull cow market. We look at 50% lean, that's going to be a lot more indicative of what's going on in the fed cattle market. We get a lot of our lean from that cull cow marketplace. You can see if we look back, there's that historic average from 16 to 20. We've got our 2021 value that kind of rose really unusually and went counter seasonal and then remained kind of counter seasonal in its movement through 2022. Now, what was happening there? Again, um, this is actually, it kind of looks like we saw some loss in terms of pressure downward in the uh, lean price, so that would be our grind price um, on the beef carcass, but what we know is that this kind of counter-seasonal move and continued strength 
was a result of uh, inflationary pressure, right? So things were getting more expensive. And I view this, and a lot of other beef economists do view this as a relatively positive sign because rather than moving out of beef consumption altogether, consumers were moving out of those middle meats and those high value cuts and into uh, our, our, our hamburger servings and moving back into ground beef consumption. So that's where a lot of this strength came from through the, uh, through the last half of 2021 and remained strong into 2022. We finally saw some loss in terms of price support as we moved through the last half of 2022, and that was largely a result of just some really large-scale culling, right? Um, so you look into 2021, you would think that uh, we were culling a lot. How did prices remain that high? It's because ground beef demand was just incredibly strong. But while when we finally got out to 2022, what we saw is that as the drought really continued to, to expand, stay strong, uh, where it was already in place and now began to move a little bit into the southeastern United States, we um, really saw a uh, culling of cows take off and follow that seasonal trend. Oversupply obviously leads us to lower prices, um, and so you can see some of that price loss here in the ground beef sector. Thinking about um, wholesale beef ribeye prices, so this is on the high value side, what adds a lot of value to the beef carcass. We can see that um, there's that average again, that historic five-year average. We've got the 2021 values that have seen a, a lot of volatility. We typically see a seasonal increase as we move into the summer when all uh, the people in the Northeast and the Midwest move out of their hidey holes and try to grill for a couple of months and they bid up that price of beef and those high value cuts. We saw a lot of loss in terms of price in that marketplace as we moved out of 2021 and into 2022. Stayed relatively flat. That inflationary pressure that was in some ways supporting ground beef prices really pressured downward on the, the high value cuts. But you can see here at the very tail end of the year, we saw kind of an increase again in some of our middle meats and our high value cuts. So a question, those of you out in the audience, who in the last five years and last three years has cooked a brisket or a prime rib or some other uh, beef product for Christmas um, for the first time? Or who, has, who did that in 2022? Did anybody have a prime rib or a brisket? We got one person willing to admit it. We got a couple of folks out here. So when, when you ask this question, there's a growing trend in, term of, in terms of moving away from turkey that we see in retail consumption and into other types of products that are largely moving to beef for the Christmas serving, and in some cases, lamb as well. And so what we know is that some of that price support at the end of the year, where we would typically see losses, is now contributing to a higher value retail uh, sale here at the end of the year. So that's a positive trend again for beef demand. All of this goes together. There's a lot more primals and subprimals we can look at, but the reality is demand for beef is strong and it all goes into that boxed beef price. We can see a lot of that volatility. We always see a seasonal rise um, on average as we move into the summer, but this is an outsized uh, uh, data point because of how high um, prices got following the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. And so what we expect is some seasonal increase as we uh, stay flat through the spring, but rise again, moving into the late spring, early summer. You can see we're beginning the year 2023 here at just over $280. Um, and that's very close already to where the, the uh, historic average was by the time we got out to uh, the summer months, significantly higher than the previous five-year average. So I put this price chart up there then to show that the correlation between the two of these products is uh, inversely related. Now, I know there's been a lot of discussions over the last two or three years about uh, the breakdown between uh, uh, beef prices and live animal prices. And I'm here to tell you that those two markets do largely move together. They're strongly correlated, but they are not the same product, right? Live animals are a very different thing from a beef product at the grocery store. And that pinch point in the middle is harvest capacity. And when there's a, a breakdown in harvest capacity or lack of harvest capacity, those two markets move opposite of each other. And so I put this chart up to show you that historically, the main driver of price, we've got calf price here in blue, we've got cattle inventory in red, and what you can clearly see is increased inventories typically lead to low prices, lower inventories lead to high prices. And why do I put this up? Again, to show you that it is very strong opposite correlation between the two. So when supply is low, price is high. And I also, the second point there is that supply is really, really low right now. So we can expect some real strength in the live cattle and as a result, the cow-calf sector 
um, in the next year or two or potentially even three, depending on what the drought uh, continues to do. We'll talk about why here in a second. Just illustrating that inventory loss as we move through time, we've got that 30 years ago, 30 million, you know, 37 million head kind of up here on the top side, about 35 and a half it looks like was our peak inventory in the last 30 years. Over time, we've slowly moved lower, even though we're producing more beef in total, so that's more beef produced per, per animal. This is beef cow inventory. Saw a slow increase after uh, the, the uh, increase in prices and those record-breaking prices here in 2014, 2015. We reached a cyclical peak in terms of inventory and we were already culling as we moved into the pandemic. Lost some inventory here. We lost 2% of the beef cow herd between 2021 and 2022. And Dave Anderson, who is our state livestock economist and models a lot of this stuff, suggests that based on beef cow slaughter, we probably lost 4% of the beef cow herd from 2022 into 2023. You have to go back to the early 1980s to see that much beef cow culling. So what do we think back to again, that supply and demand relationship? Not only does it matter that they are moving against each other, it matters how fast they're moving against each other. And a 4% loss in beef cows is a significant loss. If you think about the last three years, we've lost about 8% of the beef cow herd. That's a substantial loss if this 4% holds. So in terms of looking at this graphic, what that means is fewer cows, just means fewer calves in the upcoming year. If we lost 4% of the cows last year, that means 4% of the calves that would have been in the pipeline this year are no longer in the pipeline to become beef. Again, think back to strong demand already being supportive of prices. We're looking at the supply side now also being indicative of strong prices. The only way to prevent this liquidation from, from um, uh, really increasing prices is if we hold back a lot of heifers. But the reality is we called 3% of the heifer herd last year and expect to lose a lot of heifers in the upcoming, well, the upcoming report that would be loss over 2022 as well, because the drought has simply made it too expensive to feed cattle or, or excuse me, on pasture, or we simply didn't have uh, the forage to feed them at all. So again, illustrating that trend, beef cow slaughter hit record breaking levels on a weekly basis throughout 2022. It remained strong. And again, just to illustrate, you think back to how good or how strong beef, uh, uh, ground beef prices were at the, at the retail counter even though we were calling record-breaking numbers of, of uh, beef cows, um, the price of beef, of ground beef still remains strong. So um, that's how strong ground beef demand was throughout the last couple of years. So really high beef cow slaughter, illustrating that we lost a lot of the productive asset base of the beef industry, which means fewer calves in the upcoming year. We can again begin to see this take hold as we move out of the five-year average through 2021, every single month almost, I believe every single month, and then for many of the months through 2022, we broke the record for cattle on feed in terms of head on feed. But if you look at the end of the year, those curves begin to cross. What does it mean when those curves cross and remain uh, crossed over time? It means that the trend is reversing. So we see that the trend here is for lower cattle on feed into the near future, and again, as supply goes down, we expect price to go up. So just on the supply side, we're expecting to see strong prices the next year or two as well. As profitability remains strong in the retail sector, they demand more beef. That flows back to the packer, to the feeder, to the cow-calf sector, right? What's being borne out in the prices that we're seeing for live cattle. So this slaughter steer price is at about 13 or 14 weight here on the Southern Plains. Started the year out at about buck sixty per pound. That is a very strong opening price. We look back; the historic five-year average is about a buck twenty, and I believe had fallen as low as a buck oh five to open the year, if I remember correctly. That derived demand, when we're getting a lot of money for our fed steers that are thirteen and fourteen hundred pounds, feeds back into the pipeline for our feeder calves. So our seven and a half weights basically started the year out here at about a buck eighty-five. And I've seen prices that were higher than that on individual reports, much stronger than where the, the five-year average price set. We expected to see more strength as we move through 2022. Uh, right here, that's February 24th of 2022, Russia invades Ukraine. Corn gets a lot more expensive. And the ability of feeders to manage their margins is a little bit more constrained. And so demand for those animals remained a little lower than we expected. And so prices were pressured downward through the first half of the year. But rose as soon as we had better information on where the corn crop was going. Russia began to uh, give some leeway on exporting corn out of Ukraine. Prices remain strong and we expect them to get, if anything, higher in the next six months, if not for a longer period. 
So takeaways on the market aspect, expect increasing prices, and I'll say this, y'all can come you know, find me at my office in a year or two and smack me over the head if I was wrong, but um, the reality is we expect record-breaking prices in the next year or two, and in some cases we expect those prices to hold for a sustained period because when you think about a drought call as opposed to a profitability call, profitability signals are more gradual and have more gentle slopes down and gentle slopes up. A drought-induced call means that we call some animals that would have been profitable in a normal year. So what we have to do in order to restock that independent slot is we have to hold back a heifer, which if you look at the percent of, of cattle on feed that are represented by heifers, it is almost a record-breaking level right now. But we have to hold heifers out of the beef production supply chain, which means that that's another loss in beef production for the very short term. Those heifers have to grow to maturity. Those heifers then have to be bred, which is 30 to 60 days on average then gestate for 283 days, and then that calf takes 18 to 24 months to become uh, a live animal ready for harvest. And so that's a significant amount of time between when we get rain and people begin deciding to hold heifers back, and then we get back to normal beef supply. So all of this is also without talking about the potential for new harvest capacity in the United States, uh, and particularly locally, which is gonna be very important for what happens to these calf prices in the near future. So that's what we expect to see in the cattle market. I will say, obviously, inputs remain high. Not everything is uh, perfect for, for the cattle market, but we do expect input prices to go down in terms of feeding cattle over the next 365 days. Corn forecast for the season average farm price is down about a buck 50, and then for, for um, wheat, we're at a loss of about a buck 20. So still not cheap, certainly, um, but a little cheaper than what we saw last year. Thinking about profitably rebuilding our herd, there's a question mark on my presentation and, and we were talking earlier and Donna thought that meant I didn't know what I was gonna talk about. And the question here is, do, is it time to rebuild our herd? As we see these things like, like increased prices and the potential for some more normal rainfall, many of us are gonna start thinking about whether or not it's time to go buy cows. The drought is still in significant force here and I'm not gonna belabor this point because we've got a professional meteorologist in the room who's actually gonna talk about these things, but my, my entire point being that if we look here at dry conditions, some potential for normal rainfall and moving into the summer, some, some conditions that we're more accustomed to seeing, which are still relatively drier in our part of the world, but, but if we move into it beginning to rain, what we see is after the first big rain, a lot of us are gonna run out and see what kind of cows we can buy, right? I think that's pretty common. And I know folks that did that in the early 2010s drought and sincerely had this conversation yesterday. I am not making this story up. One of the gentlemen who did that told me he finishes his payment on those cows next month. So the question is, is it time to restock? And I'm not gonna be able to answer that question for you. What I'm gonna do is tell you we wanna evaluate that decision very critically and make sure that we're getting a, the appropriate financial deal whenever we go out and we buy animals to restock our herd. Here's some recent replacement prices um, from, from High Plains auctions. So I get an average of, of Texas High Plains auctions from Dowhart, Tulia, uh, uh, Will Dorado now, um, and we look at what was available. These cows are all real examples, except for this bolded one in the middle. We'll talk about her in a second. Everything else here is a real example that was available in late December. What I've got up here is our forecast of annual cow costs and calf prices into about the next seven year time horizon got the forecast of calf prices as we move out. Those are probably a little conservative compared to what some of you might be able to get, depending on what size you sell and all that kind of stuff. But this is for about a, about a five and a half weight calf moving out into the time horizon we can see. So this is the age of that cow that we wanna buy, her stage in terms of her bread stage, the weight, price per head, and the number of calves that we expect her to have in this time horizon. Then I've got net present value, and all net present value does is it takes all this data, puts it together, we discount it using an interest rate and decide whether or not that was a profitable investment today based on the information we have available to us today. What you can see is it's a mixed bag, right? We can see that, and I'm gonna tell you, I think I've been relatively generous with these gals on what they're gonna be able to calve over their time horizon. So we got a three-year-old here. If she can have six more calves in addition to gestation right now, and that, that's technically 10 calves. If you average 10 calves per cow, I need to talk to you after the presentation, please, because we need to get you up here talking to us about what you're doing right. 
And on average, what our extension specialists see and tell me is that we can expect a good herd to average six and a half or seven calves per cow over her lifetime. That is a, that is a representative average. And so being generous with these gals right here, just for example's sake, if you can get her to have six more calves over the life of her entire production life, she's going to net you a return today of $82. We look at this cow, who's a little bit more expensive. She is closer to the end of gestation, so a little more value there. Six more calves, a loss of 264. Looking through here, again, we got a profitable cow right here at 1335. Four more calves, $65 in positive return. What I want to point out here is I've adjusted this same cow to lose a calf somewhere in that four-year time period. That's almost a $200 swing. And so that's how important it is to be realistic with yourself in terms of the number of calves your herd can realistically produce on average because there's $200 swings per head easily based on the cost that we expect in the near future, right? And that's if, that is if prices remain here. If you think back to where we were in the early 2010s, we saw $3,000 replacement heifers without question, right? So all I put this up here to illustrate for you is before you run down to the sale, after the next rain, run your numbers, sit down and put some data on paper. And if you don't have data available from your own operation, call me and we'll talk about some representative data for the area. We'll do our best to figure it out for you. Some stuff where the math is harder and I honestly just didn't feel like doing all the really difficult math because it's really rep not hard to put together for a representative ranch. Some things to think about though are genetics do have a value, but the most important indicator of profitability on a cattle operation is a weaned live calf. If you look at any studies that have been done that are reliable, the number one indicator of profitability is not genetic quality. It is um, uh, the cow's ability to have a live weaned calf at the end of the, the production year. So think about making sure that certainly we want to match our cows to our environment and get genetic value where we can. But the most important thing is that she is successfully weaning a live calf. In an accounting sense, obviously, we, look, we think about hoping that that cow pays for herself directly, obviously. But another way to think about it is a negative NPV or a loss on that cow is a burden on all your profitable cows. You have to carry those costs somewhere and it's going to be across your other cows. So we certainly want to think about that in weighing down our productive assets that we already own. If you've got a productive cow herd, do you want to bring on a super expensive gal that's going to make everyone else lose a bit of money, lose a bit of profit potential? And is that the best use of your base of all assets? So we did talk about the productive asset base of the beef industry being the cow. But in reality, she's a mining instrument, right? And she's mining the value out of whatever forage you have available. So the reality is, is a new high dollar gal who's gonna weigh down your other expensive cows, or sorry, sorry, your other cows, weigh down their returns. Is she the best use of your productive asset base, which is that forage, right? And then depending on your purchase strategy, I'm not saying that going out and buying cows is the wrong thing to do. We certainly wanna think about our age curve and the makeup of our herd over time and, and, and the quality that we wanna keep in that herd in terms of age and reliability of calving. There are scientific things that we certainly wanna consider. And if you're getting a little bit older cow herd, there's some risk involved in that certainly that is quantifiable, though it is difficult to put pen to paper on. But what we wanna think about here is make sure that you have a plan, right? And you can certainly put pen to paper and see that I'm gonna lose money on this expensive cow, but I like looking at my cows. It's better to know that you're gonna lose money on them than be surprised at the end, right? It's better to have a plan, plan for the worst case, and react to the best case, certainly. So that's, that's some non-economic or some really difficult math things to put to pen to paper, but make sure you have a plan. To do all of this on your own, we have a bunch of decision tools that can help uh, evaluate these choices. You wanna find that best ROI, again, for that grass, or whatever that forage base is. Uh, we have a, a tool called the Cow Bid Price Calculator. At this address, just follow that web address to resources, to decision aids, to beef cattle decision aids. It's gonna take you to a 60 or more decision tools that help you evaluate a bunch of manage management choices on your cow-calf or your fed cattle operation. And what this is gonna do is you're gonna be able to put in your expectations of uh, price, of uh, cost, of how many calves you, calves you expect her to have. And then that's gonna give you those NPVs. I'm not a genius by any means, trust me. We got people that are from Tulia who know. Uh, what I'll tell you here is uh, I used this very tool to give you all the data that I just put on that, that screen a second ago. We try to make this as simple for you as possible. If you're not comfortable using this, call me and we'll do it together. 
got a lot of other tools that I hope will help you make some more decisions, but in terms of our presentation today, this one, the cow bid price calculator is the most important. So finally, thinking about some things that could really inject a lot more demand and potentially even more price strength into the cattle market in the near future, think back to that additional harvest capacity, particularly some that might come out of the Texas High Plains or it might come into the Texas High Plains. Um, and also with this being a, a water focused meeting, we wanna think too, not, not critically or, or, or um, with any sort of uh, goal in mind other than to think about the impact new harvest capacity might have on water, right? So thinking about regrowing not only our own herd, but as the herd regrows and potentially grows beyond where it was prior to our drought induced culling, what does that mean for our water situation locally? So growing live cattle demand in West Texas is a very real possibility. And it's all a result of that producer owned beef project that is, that is slated for opening in 2025. So brief overview of what that facility is. It's a, a cooperatively owned and operated uh, a beef packing facility slated to open in 2025 and slated to harvest 3,000 head a day with about 233 days of harvest on average in the beef processing industry. We expect that to uh, create 700,000 additional hooks on an annual basis in terms of demand for live cattle or fed cattle, right? Um, so that means that all that information we were talking about earlier and how long it takes to regrow a calf after a drought induced cull of a beef cow, we now have to grow 700,000 more calves somewhere. And that's not all gonna be in West Texas. That's not all gonna be in the Panhandle. We won't even feed all 700,000 of the new animals in the Panhandle. Economic redistribution will send some of those slots to Kansas. We'll send some of those slots to Oklahoma. Even though this plant only intends to buy from Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, some of the economic growth and redistribution of cattle will happen in Kansas. Um, or in some in Nebraska, as there's a, a second plant there in North Platte, it's slated to open as well. They just got an injection of funding from Walmart, so they're, they're a solid funding base. But we think about 700,000 new head of harvest capacity each year. Pre-COVID, our annual cattle harvested totaled 3.5 to 4 million head annually, which was roughly tailored very well to the amount of calves we slaughtered on an annual basis um, between the three large plants. That doesn't include Cavanus, which also has a, a harvest footprint. That new facility is going to increase our total demand by about 20% for live cattle. The day it comes online and potentially even six or eight months in advance, because they will be, I understand, pricing on a formula basis, if I understand that correctly. And so they'll start bidding those calves and setting prices a little bit in advance. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of price activity may be coming as early as 2025. That's key for us here on the Texas High Plains because on average, we know they already intend only to, to purchase live animals from, from Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, but also the beef quality audit shows us that on average, a fed calf only travels about 135 miles uh, from, from its feedlot to its harvest destination. So there's just not a lot uh, of sourcing outside of our region that they'll be doing. What does that mean for water use in the next few years and over time? POB estimated use in terms of its actual direct use at the packing facility. They estimate 700 gallons per head per day with 700,000 heads, so that's 489 million gallons a year, about 1,500 acre feet. You'll see news releases and, and the reality is that that totals roughly 800 to 1,000 acres of corn in terms of its water use over, over a year, just to give you kind of a, a reference of how much water use it is. Um, this is also Keep in mind, they expect 85% of that to be recycled for use on crops or use on washing pens. So, so it does lower actually their water use um, compared to if they were pumping for uh, their own uh, irrigation, pumping for their own cleaning and all of those things. They do intend to recycle quite a bit of it. We also expect to increase direct fed cattle water use somewhere on the Southern United States High Plains Again, somewhere we have to get 700,000 more fed cattle, and some of that will come in Kansas, Oklahoma, other places, but 12.5 gallons per head per day on average, times 180 days on feed. Really, and when you think about, and it's probably, they need it 365 days if we to continue that rotation over, but in reality, each individual animal on feed 180 days, 1.5 billion gallons a year, 4,800 acre feet. Again, so that would lead us to something like we had 1,000 acres of corn right here, roughly. Right here, we've got about, what would that be, 4,000, 4,500 acres of, of corn, roughly. I'm, I'm doing that math in my head. I'm actually not really good at math in my head, even though I'm an economist. So 
Just take those numbers with a grain of salt. But this is not really realistically where we expect the majority of that additional water use to come from, right? We expect some water use to change because of new feed demand. So uh, 21.5 pounds of feed per day if we're targeting 3.5 uh, pounds per day in terms of average daily gain. Again, 180 days, 700,000 head. It's 2.7 billion pounds of feed annually. And I don't, I don't intend to suggest that all of that feed is going to come from the Texas High Plains. There are certain circumstances where we have already reached the barrier of how much feed we can grow, right? In a lot of cases, we've already reached the barrier on feed growth. And even up north, where they're pumping 400 gallons a minute, we have kind of reached the upward barrier. But what this means for those of you who have cattle and crops or just crop farmers is that um, the basis for feed grains, we certainly expect to go up. And, and also there might be some additional opportunities for silage in the very near future, not just from the dairy growth, but also from an increased demand from fed cattle. So um, it's a lot to cover in a very short amount of time, uh, but this is my information. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my email, this is my office number, but it forwards directly to my cell phone, just so you know. I was getting phone calls from China for like six months. I didn't know what was going on. They had forwarded my office number directly to my cell, and I didn't realize, and for some reason it told me it was coming from China. Got that all figured out. You call this number, it's gonna go directly to my cell, and I'll pick up, and we can talk about whatever you're interested in. Write a weekly blog where we talk about a lot of these issues with um, our economist in Vernon and our new economist here in Lubbock, Andrew Wright, who is brand new, started in January, uh, uh, this year, January 1st, what is it, 18 days on the job. He's gonna be a really good addition to, to our group and I, I hope that you all get a chance to meet him soon. Lastly, about 120 ag economists have come together across the South from Texas to Virginia to write a daily newsletter called Southern Ag Today and uh, that is something that populates a bunch of information about the South and the, South ag, the Southern Ag economy um, into your inbox on a daily basis if you hold your camera phone up. Look at that QR code, it'll take you to the website and um, then you can sign up for the email blast. So certainly appreciate y'all's time. I don't, do we have time for questions? It looks like I've gone over for about two minutes. So I'll stick around for a while too if you guys have any questions. Thank y'all. Thank you, Dr. Benavides. We surely appreciate your insight and expertise in, in terms of what we can see in the coming in the coming year with the supply and demand issues. Most of you who have attended previous water colleges are familiar with our next presenter. Brian Bledsoe is the chief meteorologist, climatologist for KKTV 11 News in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Brian's goal is to help ag producers make their business more successful. He frequently speaks across the region about weather and the importance of using long range forecasting to help your business. According to Rick Kellison, the last time that we had acceptable rainfall was in this growing season of 2019. Additionally, that is the last time that Brian Bledsoe was here to present to us in person. Since 2019, most of you are aware of the conditions we've had. So please join me in welcoming Brian Bledsoe in person once again. And hopefully that's a good sign, Mr. Bledsoe. Well, it is good to be back here in person, you know. Had to navigate Southwest Airlines a little bit here in the past couple of days, but I think that's about what everybody else has been having to do with them over the past couple of months or so. But um, I want to start off by saying today that I, I, for the most part, when we're dealing with the kind of conditions we've had around, not just for you folks down here in South Plains, but also up in the Western High Plains, my backyard, it, it's real tough to paint a picture of optimism when there hasn't been any optimism as far as the weather goes uh, for a while. But draw your attention to a couple of things here that have been happening uh, just since we've started the winter. We've had record moisture going on in California. 
and we all know what they've been dealing with, and not just for the past year, but they've had struggles off and on with drought for quite some time. And, and, and when they miss a wet season out there, it's bad. I mean, it's, it's a completely different animal out there, for those of you that don't know, because they're used to getting so much moisture and the demand for water, not just from a population standpoint, but from an agricultural standpoint, it really puts them behind the eight ball, just one. You miss two, you really compound things. You miss three, it becomes dire. And that's essentially the situation that they've been in out there for a while. So all the stuff that they've been getting out there, while a lot of it due to their lack of infrastructure to capture most of it, have been a problem, but they're doing some good things out there. State of Nebraska, uh, I work for some folks in the southwest part of the state that had the worst drought they've had in, in decades on their place, and they're covered in snow. And it's not just a little bit of snow, but they've had about four different snowstorms move across from northeast Colorado across most of Nebraska, especially central and southwest, um, that have been between about 10 and 15 inches apiece. So there's, there's some things going on. My, my, the point that I'm trying to draw there is that in places where drought has been a problem, when drought breaks, it breaks. And you have to be ready for some of that kind of stuff. And uh, coming from a country where we average you know, 16 inches on a good year of moisture, which is an average, we never really get that anyway. We get north of that or south of that most of the time. But, uh, you have to prepare yourself to be able to capitalize on that particular time. So that's kind of my message today, that you need to start getting ready to be able to capitalize on the pattern change that I think is going to be upon us before too long. So I'm going to kind of do what Justin did here a little bit, because I have to be active when I do this kind of stuff. But I always want to start people with this particular graphic, or a variation of it, because this right here, what you're looking at, is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Chart, or the PDO. And this is an oscillation in the Pacific Ocean. It has warm phases and cool phases. And this takes you all the way back to 1854. So you can see we've had various times where we've had warm and cold phases along the way. But anytime somebody asks me, it's like, you know, uh, it used to rain all the time. We were supposed to get this rain when I was a kid or when I was growing up. And then I show them this graphic. And this is the past 25 years. And it doesn't take a professional meteorologist, as Justin so eloquently put a little while ago, to uh, see that there's a whole lot more blue on that graphic than there is red. And so if you want to draw something that's very linear here to the struggles that we've been having in getting moisture not only in the spring and summer, but also through the fall and winter for the past quarter century, all you got to do is look at that graphic. Anytime the PDO is in a negative or a cold phase, we struggle. In the southwest, in the western high plains, and there are other parts of the country that do the same thing. But you can also draw uh, some points to where there have been some relative good times in here. The last what I would consider beneficial good time here that lasted for a while is after we came out of the terrible times from late 10 through 13. And that's when the Pacific warmed up a little bit. We got a pretty solid El Nino, in fact, the strongest on record by some counts. And we had some really good times there in terms of not only getting the water we needed for some crops, we were able to fill up some dams, we'll get some recharge going, so on and so forth. But if you're scratching your head as to why we've had water issues and why we've had drought issues for the past 25 years, that's where you need to start right there. These are the precipitation anomalies for the past 25 years on a yearly basis. So January through December from 98 through 22, these are the precipitation anomalies that have occurred through those years. Again, very linear. When the PDO is negative, this area of the country right through the middle is drier than average. California struggles as well. The only real good area here has been in the Ohio Valley and up in the Northeast. But you can see all this yellow uh, through the midsection of the country, those are drier than average times right there. So even if you put in some good years that are going on there, and by good I mean excessively wet, um, you can see what happens for the most part when the PDO is in a negative phase. This is the past year. These are anomalies in inches for the past year. So I want to go right back to that. That's where we've averaged out for the past 25. Oh, look what happened. It's been dry right where it should have been dry right in the center part of the country. And some of these anomalies here across south central Texas, that's a negative 21 for those that may not be able to see. That's pretty substantial stuff. Now we've got pockets that have done better, 
far west Texas, far south Texas, a little bit out here east, but as a whole, the state has struggled. And to be honest with you, I, the fact that we are not in worse shape than we are right now um, is somewhat surprising. Southwest Kansas has been in terrible shape and on up here in the Missouri Valley. But you can see here parts of northeast Colorado, northern plains, a lot of this came last spring up here across uh, eastern Montana and Dakotas, and then we had a really good monsoon season out here across the e uh, western half of New Mexico and Arizona. We're still doing some pretty uh, awful stuff here across eastern New Mexico in terms of anomalies. And to zoom in a little bit more closely here, you can see that there's a lot of ugliness on that graphic. So w where we're starting here is a very significant lack of subsoil moisture to begin with. And obviously, whenever the wind blows, that compounds things in a pretty, uh, pretty significant fashion because of where we've been. That, again, is a drought monitor for Texas. The biggest problems we've got here, largely in the panhandle, little pocket right there. Uh, south central Texas is a problem. And you can see here across east and southeast Texas, well, they were able to benefit from some tropical stuff and at least a little bit better rainfall. But again, they are usually doing better east than we are out here in the west. This is some pockets that did OK uh, during the monsoon season. But we need to fix this in a hurry um, before it continues to compound itself. And it's a very tricky forecast going forward as to how fast we could fix this. So let's look at sea surface temperature anomalies here. And right here, this area that I have ovaled is the ENSO region. This is where we look to see what sea surface temperatures are doing, uh, whether they're uh, tipping toward an El Nino, a La Nina, or La Nada, uh, which is basically neutral. Um, and this area of blue has been shrinking, not only in size, but in magnitude since late November, early December. So I, by all means, think we have absolutely peaked as far as this La Nina is concerned, and we are starting to go the other way, uh, and in some cases, a decent fashion. But it's not just about this guy right here. Whenever I talk about a negative PDO or a cold phase of the PDO, you always look for this blue horseshoe right here, where you get colder than average water in the Gulf of Alaska, down the west coast, and out here into uh, the uh, out toward Hawaii. So the opposite of that is when we take warmer than average water and slam it right up here next to the coast and we get colder than average out here. There are some signs that that is trying to change. However, that changes a whole lot slower, uh, more slowly than the La Nina place out here in the Central Pacific. So, uh, and I really want to drive this point home because there's been a lot of chatter online about how this El Nino is coming up and it's going to be beneficial to everybody and good times are here. It doesn't work that way. In order for this thing to truly work, you have to have the La Nina go away and you have to flip the phase of that PDO to make things tick. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in just a little bit and what it could mean. This is the February sea surface temperature anomaly forecast from the Euro seasonal model, okay? So right out here is that same region and you can see what happens. It goes basically right back here to neutral and there's still some cooler than average water out here in the west central Pacific right along the equator, but that's February. That's April. You can see how quickly we can change in the ENSO region. Now you might say, wow, we're going to go to El Nino that quickly. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to warm up that water, and that warmer than average water has to couple itself, if you will, to the atmospheric patterns. They have to work in tandem. So warmer than average water for one month out here doesn't mean an El Nino. We need about three months worth of that stuff for it to really start to go to work. And you can see that through July, it gets even more pronounced out here. But also, notice what happens up here. I want you to watch right up here. You see how that warmer than average water starts sloshing farther to the east? That's the important tell that I'm really interested in. I know this La Nina is going away. That's old news. Been old news for about a half a year, OK? The PDO change is something that gets no attention. And to me, it's even more important than what we're talking about with this El Nino or La Nina thing. La Nina transition to El Nino? Yeah, I think so. Over here on the left side, these are La Nina probabilities, December, January, February, way up there, because obviously we're in a La Nina right now. But you can see what happens. They rapidly go away. We go back here to neutral probabilities, up around 90%, close to it, March, April, May. And the neutral goes away, and you see the El Nino probabilities go up here, up to about 50% for August, September, 
in October. And that's where I want it to start, too. I got a question uh, uh, from Justin earlier when we were in the chow line a little while ago, and he said, sometimes this El Nino thing that materializes during the summer isn't necessarily all that beneficial. And I was like, you're exactly right. I want that El Nino to materialize in the late summer and fall to co coincide with the seasonal change when the uh, weather pattern gets active. I mean, does it rain in Texas in July and August? Most of the time, we have to rely on something tropical to really make that happen. I'm more interested in what happens as we head toward the fall to really make this thing turn around and actually work and not just be something fleeting or something that's spotty with rainfall. Another piece of evidence here, and I know this is a little bit deeper, so uh, maybe something you've never seen before. The QBO is a, called the quasi-biennial oscillation. It's wind that are way up there at the top of the atmosphere, all right? And there's easterly phases and there's westerly phases. Well, this goes all the way back to 1980, all right? So you can see there at the top of the atmosphere, up here in the upper left, right up there, you see that when it starts to go westerly. That's important. When it goes easterly, that's important too. But I've ovaled a couple of areas here. Look what happened from back, say, in 6 all the way through 12. Every time we got this easterly up there at the top, that's when we had rough times. We had prolonged rough times in here. And then we got a little break, and then it came right back. Look at that, 11 and 12, even a 13. But it broke, and look what happened here, 15, after we got to start to 15. You see where that westerly phase starts, and it goes deeper down in the atmosphere? Well, look over here where we are. We've come out of this El, uh, La Nina episode, and we started to see that materialize last year. But see how it kind of put on the brakes? Look where it is now. I think that's the complete final nail in the coffin for, for this La Nina to not only just go away, but go away for a little bit and for us to actually change the phase. And when you're looking at this stuff, it's tough, man. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're talking about making a forecast, okay, for someone if they want to go out and play golf tomorrow. Is it going to rain? Well, okay. We're not talking about something that precise. There are a lot of different forensics when it comes to the atmosphere that can give you a tell if something is actually going to really happen or not. There's a lot of evidence that's showing up historically and what's happening right now to make this transition, I think, work. Another piece of the puzzle is another oscillation here. This is the Madden-Julian oscillation. This is probably the single most important weather phenomena that impacts you and your business that you may or may not have ever heard about. And this is a 40 to 60 day cycle. It's tied to thunderstorm development way over here in the Indian Ocean. And what that thunderstorm development does is it sends little impulses across the Pacific. And when it gets into certain regions, it can mean wetter than average conditions for some areas and drier than average conditions for others. But the importance of this thing is that it needs to cycle to keep weather variability going. When it doesn't cycle, it gets stuck in a rut. And really, for the past uh, three years, it's been stuck in a rut. And what you're looking at right here on the left side is a forecast time frame. So January 19th through February 1st. And over here on the bottom, you can see over here the various geographical regions, the Indian Ocean over here, uh, all the way over here into uh, the ENSO regions, which are just off the west coast of South America. These are the different uh, phases of the MJO. These are easterly trade winds that have been blasting across the Pacific going this way. These are westerly trade winds that have been blasting across the Pacific this way. And where they meet, that's where the MJO basically stays. So for the past couple of years, these two have been meeting right over here. Well, since the La Nina trade winds have been weakening a little bit, the MJO has been allowed to go a little bit farther east, and you see what's been happening for those areas that I mentioned right off the top that were struggling with drought. They've actually been able to increase their weather variability and get some moisture. The problem with it is, is it's locked in place because we still have this trash going on. Once we rid ourselves of the La Nina, we rid ourselves of these trade winds, these westerly wind bursts will move farther across the Pacific Ocean. That increases weather variability, that also tends to support the development of an El Nino and the maintenance of an El Nino. So it's not just about one or two things here, and that's another one of my points. It's very complex, and these things all have to kind of work together to make things work. But I'm very encouraged by what's happening right here. Later next week, 
or uh, next week, and then obviously into February to start to see this thing tick, okay? These are the next two weeks, precipitation potential. Have you guys been following what's happening maybe for next week here in West Texas? Might get some snow. You guys hear about that today? Yeah. Well, this moisture that's uh, forecast, and again, not gangbusters, and some of the stuff that I saw earlier today actually has more moisture here because I grabbed this map yesterday. But you can see the moisture potential here across central and east Texas, and I think we may actually even get a little bit lucky here across the western part, although it may come in the form of snow versus rain. We'll have to see how that works out. But there's at least some optimism coming in uh, next week with that system. And look at the, this was actually uh, an artifact from the storm that was moving across Nebraska yesterday. Uh, but this will happen in southeast Colorado, northeast Co New Mexico, and the Panhandle of Oklahoma. This is coming uh, tomorrow and into early Saturday right there. So there are some things to like, uh, at least from where we've been. Far from perfect, don't get me wrong but at least something to talk about. Climate Prediction Center precipitation anomaly forecast. So when the Climate Prediction Center makes the forecast and a La Nina or an El Nino is in place, they go straight with what history says for that, okay? So this is a very La Nina look uh, to that forecast. Do I think that that's accurate? I think that if we can get things to break down with this La Nina a little bit more quickly, that I think this is overdone a little bit, okay? I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying maybe it might be a little bit overdone or maybe not necessarily misguided, but just being misinterpreted or misrepresented that there might actually be more variability take place than what that map would show. But that's uh, February, March, April. That's April, May, June. So notice how things shriek, uh, shrink considerably right there. And then obviously, uh, you know, the Eastern Corn Belt is looking like they might have somewhat of a late planting season this year with the way things are shaping up. But that's from the Climate Prediction Center. This is the latest NMME model. Uh, this is the North American multi-model ensemble. So this is the one that we use here uh, in our country. Uh, and I'll show you the Euro model here in just a little bit. But you can see what it's looking like for February here. Notice the areas that are at least average. The areas that are wetter than average have been basically staying the same. But if we look at March, again, that signal isn't off the charts here, OK? It's average to slightly drier than average is still potential there as we head into March. There's April. There's May. June. And I think we have one more in July. Well, that looks a lot better than it has, all right? from a modeling perspective. I know it's modeling, I know it's a ways out there, but it's something at least I'm interested in. Here's the Euro seasonal model. This is for February. Something that's interesting too, as wet as California has been, I think they're gonna shut off a little bit out there too, um, with the way the pattern's set up. Here we go to March. Again, doing better moisture here. Still not perfect. There's April. And you may also be looking, it's like, well, I still see brown right there. But it's not dominating the map like it has been. And I think that's an important thing to consider. May, well, May and June, real tells, obviously. And I think if we can get better moisture here, I don't really think this little dry tongue will still exist. I think this region will start to moisten up just a little bit. There's June, all of this would be tied to the heart of the thunderstorm season right here, including severe thunderstorms, if you're interested. Remember how I tell you when a drought breaks, it breaks? And then if we look at July, there's a hint of the monsoon coming out of Mexico, on up into uh, eastern New Mexico and far west Texas. There are some places that may still struggle a little bit here and there, but better. Haven't seen maps like this in a while. This is a IRI multi-model. It's another model looking at it for February, March, April. Again, this is the dry pocket right here. And then if we push to April, May, June, notice how not only it shrinks in magnitude, but it retracts back here to the west, okay? All right, so from a modeling standpoint, that's what that looks like. Now let's go back to this PDO thing for a little bit. Historically speaking, from 48 to 20, 
okay? From February through June, when the PDO is in a negative or a cold phase, these are the precipitation anomalies that are supposed to occur with that. Obviously, drier than average. Wetter than average up here to the north and farther east. But historically, that's exactly what should be happening during those months when the PDO is negative. All La Nina aside, okay, strictly talking PDO. Let's go back to 2013 and 2014. This is a look at the PDO. Over here is October of 2013, and it was quite negative. But look what happened here as we finished 13 and went into 14. See how it came back to neutral? Tried to go briefly positive there around May of 14, failed, and then it really took off during the back half of 14. So you might say, well, what, what happened during that time? What, as far as moisture was concerned? Well, let's look at that. January to May of 14, those were your precipitation anomalies. Again, while the PDO had not fully made that transition or made that flip. So it, La Nina wasn't there, but the PDO was still not in a favorable position to really give us a good uh, way to capitalize on it. So we still had dry anomalies going on right here. What happened during the back part of the year? Well, the whole western half of the United States opened up and it started to rain. We still had problems in parts of southeast Texas, but look up here. This was the first half of the year. Notice this corridor right here in the center. We went crazy here western Kansas, up along I-80, Corn Belt, and then we obviously had some good stuff happen here across west Texas and places. And then, when we had the El Nino that finally developed, that was 2015, the whole year. Obviously off the charts wet across all of Texas, eastern New Mexico, Colorado. I was telling uh, Justin earlier, I said May of 15, uh, we, didn't, we didn't rain but one day in May of 15 in Colorado Springs. There were places in the western side of the city that picked up over 20 inches of rain that month. For us, that is a lot. But again, came out of that drought and things turned on a dime. Isn't that how we roll in the plains? It's never average. It's either too much or not enough. That's just how it is. So in summary, that La Nina is going away. It's obviously a good thing. I'm excited about it. You guys should be too. Uh, the PDO is still quite negative, all right? So we have a little bit of work to do with that. That's why I'm not necessarily convinced that this is going to go all at once. We've got a little bit of work to do here yet uh, with the PDO to really facilitate this pattern change uh, to make it longer term and to really make it work. Uh, the El Nino development later this year, it's not a certainty. It never is, okay? There's nothing in weather that's a certainty, or climate for that matter, when you're talking about El Nino and La Nina. But it does seem likely, and I like the changes that are happening to facilitate it. So I'm also excited about that. However, it doesn't necessarily imply immediate relief. So if you hear people start squawking about El Nino's coming, and it's happening during the summertime, you might say, man, this El Nino's going on, but I'm still not getting rain. You gotta, be, you gotta wait, and you gotta be prepared to wait a little bit. You've already been waiting, so what's a little bit longer, right? Can't do anything about it. If nothing else, that pattern that's been continuously reinforced lately is changing, and that's also giving me some reason for some optimism. But you got to be ready to capitalize on that change. You have to, because if you don't, you're going to waste your opportunity as far as whether it is whatever you're going to plant, how you're going to maintenance your outfit, uh, what stuff you're going to buy, recharging the herd, as Justin was talking about. You've got to be ready to do that. And in terms of my level of optimism, cautious optimism, I think, is the way to go about this, okay, uh, for the reasons that I have mentioned. And I want you to see the pattern change for yourself and be comfortable with it before you go ahead and go about your business. You've got to be, all right? This, this system that's coming through next week, you might want to get excited about it. Don't get excited about it. Get excited about sustained relief, okay? Not just one storm. One storm's good, don't get me wrong. But is one storm really gonna make it around here? No. We gotta do some things to the soil to make things work. We gotta keep the dirt from blowing. We've gotta be able to have enough moisture to plant. We gotta have enough moisture to facilitate a crop, so on and so forth. So it's all about drought recovery. And to be honest with you, it's all about the weather pattern changing to facilitate that recovery and uh, facilitate it in a meaningful way.
Questions? Yes, sir. What is the effect on weather? I think uh, during active times, during when the sun is active, we are more prone to not only have uh, hotter summers, but also uh, when it goes through an 11 and 22 year cycles, when it does that, it helps to facilitate drought in the southwestern United States. Okay? Now some, some folks would argue that the science based around that is loose, but if you look back through history, there are definite correlations to where that, where that stuff occurs, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rick. It, it does. The, the conditions in California is, is important because we're bringing storms in from the west, all right? So again, that's part of that change in that MJO phase that has been allowing these storms to do it. Last year, California was shut out. So if California shut out, we really don't have a shot, you know, because most of those wet systems that come in here will, at some point in time, benefit us. Uh, so the fact that the pattern has changed in that regard, I think, is enough reason to at least be somewhat optimistic about things changing here, uh, you know, going forward in the long run. And recharging things out there, you know, if you, if you follow what's happened with Lake Mead uh, in Vegas, uh, for the past few years, you know, where they've been finding uh, people the mob killed, you know, back in the 50s that have been stuffed in barrels and whatnot. So people have been excited about that. Uh, you know, it's true, it's true. Uh, they're, they're excited because the snowpack is going crazy out there to so maybe get some recharge going into Lake Mead. So uh, the fact that California gets all this moisture uh, and a large part of it runs off, and goes away, I get it, you know, it's frustrating. That's not gonna change, you know, from their environmental policies, uh, policies to their lack of infrastructure and foresight to do that kind of thing. That's, that's their problem, that's not gonna change. But for us in the Western High Plains, we can take advantage of that in a different manner. As I said, be ready, have things in order to be able to capitalize on that stuff. And go ahead. For the monsoon, yes, it will. Yeah, and and for and it, it's it's kind of interesting though because you might say, well, uh, I get the tropical entities that come in here during the later summer and help, but if there's an El Nino going on, it basically tends to shut down the Atlantic Ocean from producing tropical storms and hurricanes. The wind shear is too strong across that uh, that ocean, so it tears those storms apart. So but that doesn't mean you can't get something that comes up out of the Pacific because it works the exact opposite in the Pacific. So yes, I think their chances of increased tropical stuff coming from a different way, not from the Atlantic and the Gulf, but coming up out of the Pacific are increased during that time, yes. Uh-huh. Well, what do you define as sustain, ma'am? Mm -hmm. But the way the weather is fickle, that would be unreasonable. Well, to me, for being sustained, I would at this point talk a year or two okay. as being sustained. You have to, with, with the situation as it is, someone might say, well, to me, sustained is 10 years, okay? For me in this country, I'd take, I'd take a wet year or two as, as being somewhat sustained. I think a lot of people could do a lot of good things with a wet year or two uh, to maybe turn things around. So when you're, and look, I had a guy in southwest Kansas, and he would do nothing but complain about the lack of rain. And he would chirp at me all the time. And I told him, I said, Nick, you farm in a damn desert. What are you expecting? So. Here, it's still the Western High Plains, even if you're a little farther south than where I live, you're farming in a damn desert. That's basically what it amounts to. 
So sustained relief to me is over a much shorter period of time because the fact of the matter is, how many, how many good years have occurred out of the past 10? How many good years have occurred out of the past 20? You're batting 30% good years? Is that sustainable? So again, it changes. You know, what's sustainable in the Corn Belt? You know, if they, they, if they have two, two days where it doesn't rain up there, they're squawking, okay? So that sustainability as far as what is relief is, is different geographically, I think is my point. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes? Right. Uh huh. Yes, sir. And that is the next phase that we will be going to. When that is going to happen, okay? I get that question all the time. I don't know. However, if you look at history, the PDO flips on the order of about 25 to 30 year cycles, okay? So could it flip to positive in the next five years? It certainly could. So, but we've got to get there, you know, first before we can do that. Is there enough water to get there? I think that's going to be a real question for you folks out here. In uh, talking with Jeff yesterday, uh, how fast the city is expanding? How many people are moving here? How many people are moving outside of town drilling wells? Um, you know, we're all drinking from the same glass. And uh, if there's no recharge going on, that, that glass can get pretty empty, especially if you're increasing the population that are drawing from that same glass. So uh, from, a, from an urban setting, when I talk to uh, Denver Water, and I speak to the Colorado Water Congress at times, and they get angry at me because it's like, Brian, you painted such a bleak picture. And I'm like, hey, I'm just the messenger, man. But I'll tell you what, you guys suck at managing water. How about that? And they say, well, that's bad for business. And I'm like, that's exactly right. Nobody wants to tell the builder there's no water here. So what do they do? They just keep building. Yeah. So I think the point is, is can we get to, a lot of these places, can we get to that time where we flip the pattern over a 20-year period? I think that's probably a bigger issue. And then what are we going to do when we get there? Yeah. So that's kind of why I'm saying, be ready when you, when you get that moisture. Be ready and have your plan to make it work. Yes, ma'am. In terms of temperature and, and, and precipitation? Okay, I would say, a, about 150 years, I would say, is accurate. I think since we've been measuring things better scientifically, uh, you know, uh, you could take the, the last 30 years, I think is pretty excellent. But the problem with the last 30 years is we have certain temperature sensors that have been measuring temperature in places that have had now infrastructure built around them or the land has changed around them. And everybody always wants to talk about climate change, but not a lot of people ever want to talk about what has been happening to those areas. And, and, and I point to that specifically to, in, in Colorado Springs, when somebody says, uh, you know, that city's just going crazy, and there used to be nothing but grass in open field close to the airport where they would measure the temperature, all right? Well, now they've built housing developments around that. Okay, well, all that building material does is retain heat better than an open grassy field does. So there are times now in March and April, because that's winter for us up there, okay, uh, where, say, 30, 40 years ago, storm comes through in March, maybe that temperature's 29 degrees during that, during that storm we get all kinds of snow. Now maybe that temperature's 32 degrees. The three degree difference there is a difference from 10 inches of snow piling up on the road versus driving in two inches of slush. 
okay? There's a big difference there, okay? And I think it's important. I'm sorry? That what we would deem as being accurate, I think we can sample that, yes, okay, from a climatological period, yes. But I would say, since we've been doing things better for the past 50 years, I think our sampling's a whole lot better than what it was, absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. You know, and, and take, for example, the, the great mesonet, okay? Did we have the mesonet 50 years ago? No. So now we're sampling all this data that we can put into a, um, a, a, a climatological database just for your region out here to draw from. I think that that type of information is invaluable. Uh, I was talking with Jeff and said, I wish we would have one in Colorado because our government observing stations <laughs> are so far apart that, and we have so many different, you know, terrain induced microclimates up there, we don't have nearly enough sampling to, to actually, you know, make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, it was a certain pleasure to get down here and speak with you folks again. This is always one of my favorite groups to speak to and get down here to Lubbock with fine people. Uh, so uh, if you do have questions, if I can do something for you in terms of business, obviously that's my contact information. Um, and uh, let me know. I hope to see you guys next year. Thank you. Mr. Bledsoe, we certainly appreciate your expertise, your talent, and your skill, but more importantly, the ability to communicate that to us as well as you do. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to serve as your MC for today's Water College. We encourage you to please look at the TAWC webpage for upcoming events.